Blog, where I get a chance to chat with luminaries in e-discovery and related areas. This broadcast is sponsored by Reveal Brainspace, the industry's leading AI e-discovery platform. Don't forget to subscribe to Watch Me, George Sosha, weekly with leaders in e-discovery. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to eDiscovery Leaders Live, hosted by ACES and sponsored by Reveal. I am George Sosha, I head of brand awareness at Reveal. This week we are broadcasting live from Legal Week. If you couldn't tell, this is not my usual background here. I have with me for this episode, Crystal O'Donnell, who is with Heuristica. And why don't you, before we get into anything else, tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do and what Heuristica is. Yes. So thanks, George, and thank, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this. So Heuristica Discovery Council, we are an e-discovery law firm. And so we help corporations and lawyers and lawyers. We're kind of like the lawyers for lawyers when it comes to e-discovery and everything from helping large corporations with document management and retention schedules all the way through to trial. And we actually even assist counsel during trials. So, you know, when they're asking questions and we're getting emails, see if you can find documents related to X or what the witness just said. So it really is, we become more like an adjunct group of associates to a litigation team. Which is, I mean, there are very, very few firms out there like that, right? We are very unique. We're not the only one, uh, but we are We are in a very unique space. And we find it's, people, are you a law firm? Are you a vendor? And it's like, we're somewhere in between. <laughs> when they have that question for you, they're trying to figure out, well, what are you? How do you best explain that to them? Well, I think, you know, and as you've probably seen over the last few years, George, there's a growing recognition that this is an area of law. And so, you know, 10 years ago, my that discussion would have been very different. And I think because of that growing awareness and the growing body of case law around the world, that it makes it easier to explain how we fit in as e-discovery council. <laughs> So now I'd like to get to the, the core topic I'd like to discuss yeah. with you, which is, of course, that you are not based in New York, where we are now, Correct. or in the United States. You're up in Canada. I am, in yes. the Great White North. So we have offices in Toronto and Calgary, um, and Alberta is often dubbed Texas North. <laughs> Our energy companies, that's where, you know, the pipelines from Alberta to, to Texas. Yeah, so. and, and I live in Minnesota, and we like to think about how tough we are when it comes to winter time. And Brian, you're standing directly in front of the camera, so no one sees anything but your back. Move. We're being filmed. <laughs> <laughs> your back is being filmed. <laughs> so, I live in Minnesota, where... It's not a checkerboard background, but sometimes it's, it's a white background. background. We like to think of how tough we are when it comes to winter. But then I talk with the folks from Calgary and they go, and uh, not so uh, much, or you're, you're just a bunch of wimps down there. Well, they call us wimps too, so. Yeah, you get nicer winters than we do. Yes, that's correct. But that wasn't what I was gonna no. ask you about. Rather, the whole world of cross-border issues. It, you know, it really is, you know, and, you know, uh, Ryan Short from Proteus, who mm -hmm. I know uh, they, they are also a, a reveal provider. We're going to be doing a discussion and we're calling one of these things is not like the other. And although, you know, we're very similar, the, there's small differences um, on some of the key issues, some key issues, including um, privilege the obligation to disclose documents. And in every Canadian jurisdiction, we have what's referred to either as an implied undertaking rule or the deemed undertaking rule. So do explain. <laughs> so that means in, in the disclosure process, so first understanding in, other than Quebec, uh, we have a positive obligation to disclose all relevant documents, good or bad, and whether you ask for them or not, so it's not like our system where it's a cat and mouse, mouse. scenario often. Yeah. 
I'm not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to say that that doesn't happen, mm-hmm. but generally speaking, it doesn't happen. And because of that positive obligation to disclose, the deemed undertaking rule states that if I disclose a document in the course of a piece of litigation, that document and the information from that document cannot be used in for any other matter or any other purpose without leave of the court. And so when you have related litigation, it's not to say that the court won't give you leave, but it's helped, it helps to protect the process. And one of the implications of that, so leaving aside, I'll get to the, the cross-border implication yeah. of that. It, it means that for personal information, we have the ability to say, I'm not gonna redact it at this stage because it's very time consuming and expensive. Because I know the documents that I disclose during the discovery process can't go anywhere. And a document doesn't become public until it's actually going to be used as an exhibit, either attached to an affidavit or produced in a hearing. And so often we will encourage the parties to discuss and agree that we're not going to redact non-relevant PII until the document is about to be used as a piece of evidence so that everybody saves time and cost. Major cost saving. Major, major cost saving. And when it comes to, you know, cross-border disclosure. Okay, go ahead. You know, we often tell clients before you're going to be producing documents that are going to be used in another jurisdiction, try to get court orders in place that protect that information so that you can maintain the protection of the deemed undertaking rule. Now, is there, I think there's a difference between your deemed undertaking rule and, for example, our, in our federal courts, our 502, 502D order. Is that your clawback? That's our clawback. Okay. But we've got different clawbacks, don't we? We do. So that's actually, so the clawback provisions aren't the deemed undertaking rule. Okay. So the clawback provision in, in Canada, in our jurisdictions, we automatically have a common law right to get back documents that we've inadvertently so disclosed. That's separate from the deemed undertaking. Separate from the deemed okay. undertaking rule. And so, but in order for that common law principle to apply, first of all, you have to take immediate steps once you know that it has happened. Um, and you have to establish to the court that it was inadvertent and that you've took some steps to protect the privilege. There is some early case law in Canada, when I say early, I mean e-discovery early, mm-hmm. that confirmed that the US style clawback provision doesn't quite apply. And so we refer to it as a, a modified clawback agreement because you still have obligations to take some steps. So we can't just say, we're not gonna review this stuff for privilege and it goes out the door and we can claw it back. And that was the case where the court said, no, can't, you can't do that. Okay. But, and conversely though, if you are the recipient of privileged information, we actually, as uh, counsel, we have a positive obligation to let the other side know we have something that we think was inadvertently produced. And if we don't do that, the consequences are either, um, they can range from you, you can get kicked off the file, which has serious cost consequences to your counsel. Yes. If it depending on the scope of the privileged information, sometimes the action will get dismissed, and that happened recently um, in Canada, and you can get professionally disciplined. So some definite (laughs) penalties, potential penalties here. No cost sanctions, though, typically. (laughs) And I think one of the, you know, one of the other areas that, that is different is our privilege laws are quite different. We have very similar concepts. So your attorney client privilege is very similar to our solicitor client. Slight differences. Where we differ significantly is your attorney work product and our our litigation privilege. Because in Canada, the litigation privilege is over once the litigation is over. So those documents are no longer privileged. How does that then play out? So, well, this again, when you're talking about cross-border issues, if you've got litigation that's happening in Canada and the U.S. and say the Canadian one settles first, all counsel on both sides of the border need to be aware. And again, it's about creating those court orders at the outset and maintaining whatever protections you can for as long as you can. So how do do people run afoul of all of this? 
this? Well, we see it frequently where it's run afoul in letters rogatory applications, um, particularly coming from the U.S. And to be honest with you, you know, I think on both sides of the borders, council aren't necessarily aware of the differences. So we recently had a, you know, we've got a file now where there's litigation in Alberta and litigation in California. And the Canadian lawyer didn't know that the U.S. doesn't have an implied undertaking rule. And so I said, well, you better make sure you get a court order to protect that. And she, it just took her by surprise. Right. And so it's it's just, you can run afoul the, you know, and so the letter's rogatory. And then we also have significant differences um, in Canada. You can't plead the fifth and not answer. Okay. Very <laughs> um, different. Uh, during the discovery process in Canada, generally you have the right to, you can refuse to answer a question if it's um, not relevant or if you think it's not relevant and you argue about it later in motions court or we have you know undertakings whereas i know in the u.s the deposition process is you answer it and then fight about it later we don't have to answer first okay. so that's very helpful for on the on the canadian side what also i think takes americans by surprise is in most of our jurisdictions you you can't depose anybody you want you get one representative from each party. That's it. That's it. Absent leave of the court. So for someone who grew up in the American system, the idea that I could just ask questions during the discovery process of one person seems as if my hands have been, I mean, not cut off at the <laughs> wrist, cut off at the shoulders. <laughs> How does that play out? How, does that, how do you make that work? We often get that response when we're just like, what do you mean I can ask one person? Right. So this is where we, you know, undertakings are used extensively in Canada. And because we have positive obligations to produce relevant information, so it's less, I, theoretically, the less need you have to go to ask. Now, that's not to say you can't bring, seek court approval to examine someone else. And, and it's not uncommon if, you know, if, if you find out that, okay, well, the person who knows all of the information is no longer at that company, or there are, it, it's not that difficult to get approval to examine more than one person, but you have to show why it's necessary. We also don't have the ability to examine non-parties without leave of the court. And that is very hard to do in Canada. Okay you actually have to prove in order to get an order, even to compel a third party to produce documents, you have to prove that that information is otherwise not attainable. So for example, say you and I were in litigation and you know your bank had your documents, you'd be required to get the documents from the bank and produce them. You have the positive obligation to produce relevant documents. This suggests to me that there's a much greater need to have in place structures that help foster and ensure trust between opposing counsel. What in a way that maybe we don't have so much here in the US. Yeah. You know, having done you know work on both sides, I think the, the trust factor is a little higher, warranted or not. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. In Canada, and I think it's just that ingrained, I have to produce it whether. I like it or not. And I think where it shifts is that settlement happens sooner. It's not that settlement doesn't happen. Right. But you I'm can settle before on. you have to produce the bad documents. Do you have, um, anyway, one of the challenges for us, and I'm trying to figure out how this plays out in the cross border setting is with asymmetrical litigation where you have an individual one on one side and a large organization on the other side. So then let's add this in, I don't know if this even happens, but cross-border asymmetrical litigation. Does that even make sense? It absolutely it does. And I think, you know, one of the areas, if you think about um, IP or trademark litigation, even the sheer size of our markets difference impacts you know, proportionality and impacts the number of documents. And so frequently, you know, when we're working with, with clients on, or on either side, sometimes there's sort of the, 
size of our cases tend to be smaller. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, when your damages are tied to market share, of course they're smaller. Of course. Right? And when yeah. you're thinking about, okay, well, it's a, you know, a corporation yeah. that, you know, their, their market share, the number of documents they have are going to be smaller. And so when you think about just expert, the size of us compared to the U.S., mm -hmm. less people, less clients, right. less documents. It's on, it's on a different scale. It's on a different scale. That said, you have to have all the same abilities to figure out what happened and what to do with that information, right? It's not less sophistication. No, and I think, so I see the, I see the issue more as, you know, not the difference whether you've got you know an individual plaintiff and large corporate defendant i see more disparity between parties who have different understandings of technology that's where the bigger issues come from because if you have a sophisticated plaintiff's counsel and a sophisticated defense counsel they're going to be able to understand the fact that the plaintiff isn't going to have a lot of documents and they're going to be dealing with a lot of documents that are being produced I see most of the disputes and sort of kerfuffles arising when you have divergent understanding of what should be done. That's where I think most of the disputes happen. What, um, what words of wisdom do you have for the U.S. market? <laughs> <laughs> when, they think, when they find themselves in a situation where they've got to deal with the Canadian legal system. I, I do think from a from a general perspective, you know, we want to, you know, because of our cost consequences. So if I bring a motion and I lose, I have to pay your costs. And so cost consequences are a real driving factor. So I think I think overall the level the level of settlement before a trial is probably about the same between the two countries. Okay. Maybe not. In Canada, generally speaking, we think like 97 to 98% of stuff settles. Probably about the same. Yeah. I think we just do that, get there sooner. Earlier. Earlier. Yeah. So, so I think we're probably more inclined to settle other than focus on a, a motions practice. But the judges that hear our motions probably have a different perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Probably. Well, Crystal, thank you so much for joining You're us You're welcome, today. George. It was a pleasure as always yeah, to so speak to speak with you. Adano again is with Heuristica. I'm George Sarsha with Reveal. This has been eDiscovery Leaders Live, hosted by ASEDS and sponsored by Reveal and Crystal. Thank you again. Thank you, George. Okay. okay.